high class, chapter 18 starts with the Protestant Reformation, and you'll be completing a writing assignment about it this week. And I wanted to give you a short lecture to give you the background on the Protestant Reformation and help you understand exactly what it is. So there's many different types of Protestant churches today. For example, the Baptist denomination is one of the largest denominations in the United States, but there's many, many others. So how did all this happen and where did it all begin? And to understand, we'll have to go back to the early 16th century. This is a time class when there was only one church, the first church, the Catholic Church. And a Catholic, by the way, means universal. And what we, you know, now often refer to as the Roman Catholic Church under the leadership of the Pope. And during this time, it was Leo X. When we go back to this time, it was a very powerful church and held a lot of sway over people. Um, it was very powerful politically and spiritually in that it ruled over a significant amount of territory. A lot of people were and had become Christians and were part of the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church governed people from birth to death. So for example, it, when you were born, you were christened in the church. When you got married, you were married in the church. Um, you tithed a portion of your income to the church. Uh, when you passed away, the church gave you the last right. So it was a very important part of society during this, um, this time. However, unfortunately, under the leadership of certain popes, even before Leo X, uh, the church had really began to be plagued by a lot of struggles. Um, at one point in time, the church was ruled by three different popes, and these popes and cardinals, leaders of the church, they began to live more like kings um, than spiritual leaders. They had a lot of spiritual power. They commanded armies. They made political alliances. Um, they sometimes even waged war. And something called simony, which was the selling of church offices, and nepotism, which was favoritism based on family relationships, were rampant. So there was a lot of uh, just corruption within the church. Clearly, the Pope was not left with very much time caring for you know, the souls of their constituents. And did you know, also at one time, the Catholic Church was the largest landowner in the world. Today, class, the largest landowner in the world is Queen Elizabeth of Great Britain. So what's happening is the Pope is, is you know, a corrupt, uh, serving a corrupt church. And there were some attempts made by several people to try to reform the church and let's, you know, get back to, to the original scriptures and what we're supposed to be doing here. But none of the efforts to reform the church are going to be successful, and I use that term loosely, to challenge church practices until Martin Luther's actions in the early 1500s. And what does he do and who is he? He was a German monk and a professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg. And he's going to spark what's called the Protestant Reformation. He's going to post 95 theses, which is just his ideas and, and his statements. Um, on the door of a castle church in Wittenberg. And they were, it was a list of all the statements um, that expressed that he expressed his concerns about the church, what was happening in the church. And largely, he was upset about something called indulgences. And what are indulgent, indulgences? Indulgences is a practice where the church acknowledged a donation or a charitable work with a piece of paper and indulgence that would certify your soul would enter heaven more quickly than your soul would enter heaven if you did not 
purchase the indulgence. So if you didn't commit any serious sins that guaranteed you a place in hell, and you died before repenting and atoning for all your sins, then your soul went to somewhere called purgatory, kind of a way station before you finished atoning for your sins and before being allowed into heaven. And the indulgences would certify then that your soul would enter heaven a lot more quickly by reducing your time in purgatory. So class, if you had committed some sins, not the worst sins, but just some, you know, little sins, you could purchase an indulgence from the church by making a donation. And then you would get a piece of paper that would say your time in purgatory would be very, very short. So Pope Leo X had granted indulgences to raise money for the rebuilding of a church called St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And these indulgences were being sold not far from where Luther was a professor at Wittenberg. He was really concerned about this and, you know, and the sale of indulgences and a lot of other things, but this was the main thing that he was upset about. And he was a very devout and um, religious, per, you know, spiritual person. And he had experienced a spiritual crisis. He concluded that no matter how good he was and how hard he tried, he could not stay away from sin and continue to have sinful thoughts. He was fearful that no matter what he did, no matter how many good works he did, he could never do enough to earn his place in heaven. So after studying the Bible, and he began to have an epiphany and, and believe that he found a way out of this particular problem. He read St. Paul's book, um, who, he read St. Paul who wrote the book of Romans, and he he wrote this, um, Paul wrote this, the just shall live by faith in Romans 1 17 in the Bible, in the New Testament of the Bible. And Luther understood that this to mean that, that those who go to heaven go there by faith alone. It doesn't matter how many good works you do. You can't work your way into heaven. In other words, God's grace is something freely given to human beings and not something that we can earn. And for the Catholic church, on the other hand, human beings through good works had a part in their salvation. So this went against what Martin Luther believed and he is going to confront the church about this. Now, when Pope Leo ordered that Luther recant his uh, new ideology and what he believed about the Bible, Luther he wouldn't recant and he publicly burned the Pope's order to have him recant. Leo then instructed Prince Frederick of Brandenburg to punish Luther for heresy and instead in 1521, Frederick convened a formal assembly of princes in the city of Worms to hear Luther's side of the argument, and this is called the Diet of Worms. And class, I've pulled in a clip from a movie called Luther, where you can see a reenactment of the uh, Diet of Worms, and it is phenomenal. And watch the whole movie if you can. Okay, so after the, at the Diet of Worms, um, Charles V, you know, ruled over this particular council, and he also wanted him to um, to recant and he refused to recant. And even though the Diet of Worms sentenced Luther for heresy, Prince Frederick intervened and sent Luther into exile. So unfortunately, all of this turned into violence over a period of about 50 years. Um, you're going to see several things pop up that are mentioned in the textbook. The German Peasant War is one of those. The Massacre of St. Bartholomew's uh, Day, which was where about 2,000 French Protestants were murdered. Uh, you're going to see the Thirty Years' War. The textbook talks a lot about that. Um, that was particularly brutal. And a lot of Christian, non-Christians and Christians alike are going to be um, 
punished during the Inquisition, like the Spanish Inquisition against Jewish people. So what happens is it kind of unleashes a Pandora's box. So instead of having one church, the Catholic Church, now we're going to see the development of a lot of other religions come out of this time. If it worked for Martin Luther and Lutheranism, then it can work for other people. So we're going to see a series of other religions come out that you can read about more in the textbook called Calvinism, the Anabaptist, Lutherans, and that kind of thing. So unfortunately, this is not necessarily what Martin Luther intended to happen, but it is what happened because other people were just as frustrated as he was. Too little, too late, the church um, reacts with the Counter-Reformation in about 1545. So you're looking at 30 years later before they decide to actually do something about all of this. And they originally just, you know, intended to ignore all this, but it didn't go away. And they began to lose a lot of their power. And in 14, in 1545, the church opened with the Council of Trent to deal with these issues. And the Council of Trent was really just an assembly of just high officials in the church who met. And they met off and on, and it took them 20 years class to come up with some of the rules, the new rules of the Catholic Church and kind of combine the Catholic Church back together. But they did do away with some of the things that, that um, Luther brought out, but other things they did not. So really, <laughs> what I want you to get out of, of the Protestant Reformation is what's the legacy and how does it affect you today? Um, obviously, Protestant churches begin to flourish. Um, the churches who protest, you know, the, the, the protest churches, if you will, people who broke away, religions that broke away from the Catholic Church. So instead of just having one church from the time of Christ, now we see multiple denominations being emerging from this time. So that's very important. Um, the Council of Trent, again, did sort of unify the Catholic Church's position on certain things, but it was really too little too late. You're going to see a wave of education come out of this. The Catholic Church is going to open up their own colleges and universities and schools and other religions, Protestant religions, are going to do the same. So education sort of flourishes, but it is a, a an education that's backed by religion. Um, Catholic Church really declines in authority. So instead of being the dominant, uh, we're going to rule society and rule you from birth to death, and we're going to be in cahoots with all of the leaders and princes and kings of the, of the regions, um, we're going to see that they're not as important as they once were um, after the Protestant Reformation. And we'll see a rise in monarchies and their power. And the textbook really goes into a lot of detail about that. And another um, event that's going to take place around the time of the Protestant Reformation and as a result of the Protestant Reformation is the, the scientific revolution or the age of enlightenment, the age of reasoning. Let's start talking about, you know, how we can live our lives without being under the thumb of the church. So that's one of the things that I want you to get out of your writing assignment that you'll complete this, this week is I'd like you to to read about the Protestant Reformation, research the Protestant Re Reformation, learn a little bit about Martin Luther and, and Pope Leo and, and exactly what happened, and then you're going to write a, a reflection for um, the legacy of, of the Protestant Reformation and how it affects us today. Class, as always, keep in touch.